This is the Al Franken Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. Hey, everybody, we've got a great one today, you know, for a change. I'm excited about having David Farenthold, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist uh, for the Washington Post. David won the Pulitzer uh, for his meticulously researched reporting on the uh, Donald Trump Foundation. As uh, you probably recall, Trump's foundation uh, turned out to be uh, completely fraudulent. And the state of New York shut it down after finding, and I quote, a shocking pattern of illegality. This is the president of the United States found in court to have engaged in a shocking pattern of illegality. Not just a pattern of illegality, A shocking pattern of illegality, the president of the of the United States. Now, I think you'll enjoy the interview and find a tremendous amount of entertainment value as David recounts hilarious anecdotes of corruption, malfeasance and utter mendacity. Uh, These are just priceless tales of greed from a hilarious, craven and sick family. Uh, led by Donald Trump, who is now, as I said, president of the United States. There are a number of themes uh, that come across in the shameless tales that David reported in the Washington Post and talks about uh, in our conversation. First of all, there is the tawdry, tawdry money grubbing of this guy, our president, and his entire family. These are grifters, ladies and gentlemen. They're almost caricatures of grifters because one of the other themes is just the lying, the constant, repetitive, and incredibly transparent lying. Uh, Then uh, there's pettiness and nastiness. Our president is a real piece of work. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But... The thing I want to focus on right here is the issue of trust. Because I have marveled now for a number of years at how he gets away with just how transparently dishonest he is. Now, his supporters' response to this is, don't take him literally, take him seriously. Now, I think I know what that means, but I'm not entirely sure because... For me, don't take him literally, take him seriously, breaks down when you really think about it, because usually that means don't take him literally, take him figuratively, meaning metaphorically, like don't take that literally. He's a wordsmith, a a poet uh, with a masterful command of metaphor and, and irony, and sometimes in the hands of a visionary the invocation of historical metaphor, juxtaposed with a reference that evokes, say, a decaying narrative of our collective experience can create a kind of a synthesis that we collectively had never seen before, never really understood. And this transforms our understanding of, of our history as a, as a people and a nation. That's what sometimes you say, Don't take someone literally, take him figuratively, take him metaphorically. That's not what they're saying here. No, 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 no. That's what don't take him literally means to them. Don't take him literally means just that. Our guy Trump, he's just a pathological liar. Don't take him literally because what he is saying just isn't true. It's it's just that simple. But take him seriously. Take him seriously. Now, what does that mean? Exactly. Well, I think, I think I get it. It means he's figured something out about how to get what he wants by lying constantly. He did in real estate, in ripping off contractors, being a serial cheater on his uh, various wives and mothers of his, of his children. With pretty much everything and everyone in his life. This is... This is serious shit, okay? I mean, he knows how to do this stuff. Get away with it and, and, and get power. 
Okay? That's why you need to take him seriously. So don't take him literally. He's a liar. Take him seriously. He's a malignant, voraciously power-hungry psychopath who can and will destroy anything, anyone in his path. So take him seriously. So, so don't take Trump literally. Take him seriously. That's what his friends have told us. But I've always thought that eventually that that was going to bite him and us in the ass. And let me tell you why. Because the president of the United States is entrusted with our lives. And I've been thinking all along that at some point he's going to be faced with a crisis where everyone in this country, and quite possibly the world, is going to have to trust what the president of the United States says. And when that moment comes, how the hell is the world going to trust anything? that President Donald Trump says, I hope the coronavirus is kept in check. I pray that we don't have a worldwide pandemic. That I can tell you, it's frightening. It would involve untold suffering and, and, and death globally. It would devastate the world economy and that would lead to more, more suffering and more death. And the last thing we need in a global crisis is a president of the United States that the rest of the world takes neither seriously nor literally. I think what I'm saying is that Donald Trump has a national and global credibility problem. Is he saying that the coronavirus will go away in April because it gets warm because that's based on science? I No. It's based because he wants to keep the stock market up tomorrow. He, he wants to win re-election. And the stock market has been his, kind of his ticket. The stock market's going up. Aren't I a great president? I'm a great president. The stock market's been going up. Now, maybe we can compensate for all of this. Maybe the professionals in the CDC and our our international partners in this crisis can just go about their business and just, you know, put them to the side and humor them. It, first of all, it doesn't give me a lot of confidence appointing Mike Pence <laughs> to be the uh, coronavirus czar. He's the guy that pretty much single-handedly started an HIV outbreak in Indiana when he was governor by banning free needle exchanges. But maybe he's learned something. Maybe uh, he learned something. I, I was in the Senate during the Ebola outbreak in 2014, which killed uh, more than 11,000 people worldwide. And there was a lot of fear and it was well grounded about the spread of Ebola in the United States. And, and there were a couple of just bonehead moves, uh, particularly in Texas, uh, by a hospital there that scared the, the hell out of everyone. I don't know if you remember this, but they had a patient fly from Monrovia. I believe he was an American uh, who had come from Liberia, who had been born in Liberia, and he flew uh, to Dulles and then from Dulles to Dallas. And he uh, was staying with his either his wife or his partner and, and their kids, and he was starting to feel like, very sick. So he went to the hospital, this hospital in Dallas, and they checked him out, and he had a fever of about 101, and they did not ask him uh, whether he had flown in from anywhere. So they sent him home with uh, some antibiotics, uh, which don't treat a virus. You know, everybody knows that. And at home, he got sicker. So when he uh, came back to the hospital, somebody finally noticed that he had flown in the previous day from Liberia. And finally, he was isolated. And he died a few days later, but not before two of the nurses who treated him contracted Ebola. And thank God they, they are okay. Uh, but one of them like drove to Cleveland or Akron to prepare her wedding and then got started to get sick and went on a Frontier Airlines 
back to Dallas. And uh, then she uh, was isolated. They they understood that you need to isolate these people. And thank God they're both uh, the nurses who treated this this fella contracted the virus, but are are okay today. Now, you probably don't know this, but Minnesota has quite a large Liberian population. Uh, so there were Minnesotans who had been visiting relatives back in Liberia, then flying back, and this generated a lot of fear and suspicion. But our healthcare people in the hospitals and the airport were unbelievably great. Uh, they created protocols to, to test people who landed in, in, in Minneapolis who had originated from Liberia. Uh, five or six hospitals in the Twin Cities area uh, created units to isolate people uh, who came in with the virus. We had uh, special ambulances that were ambulances to carry people in a way that isolated them from the people handling them. Uh, we trained personnel to transport these folks. I I knew this because I was senator and I was working with, with all these people. Now, no one who arrived at, at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport ended up, no one carried uh, Ebola. And the whole protocol was extremely well handled. It was executed flawlessly, and it worked. And a part of that is that we had the CDC at the time all over the world in low-income countries, especially Africa, helping them to identify and halt epidemics before they would, could cross the borders. They did this many, many times. Uh, we had been doing epidemic work in 40 or pandemic work in 49 countries, uh, but last year... The Trump administration cut the funding for the program to a level where they could only cover 10 countries. Now, at the time, current and former CDC officials and global health professionals were saying that this was dangerous. Uh, but former Republican colleagues of mine, uh, Bill Cassidy from Louisiana is a doctor. He was just fine with it. He said at the time that additional CDC funding, quote, doesn't seem, in a time of scarce resources, a wise use of resources. In a time of scarce resources. We're talking about a few hundred million dollars for this program. The tax cut that I, I told my friends across the aisle, on the floor, I told them this would explode the deficit. That tax cut is adding and will add trillions, trillions to our debt. Now, who has any idea how much this thing, the coronavirus, is going to cost the world economy and cost us? Not to mention the death and suffering. I just don't have a lot of reason to trust the Trump administration and no reason to take whatever Donald Trump says seriously. For example, that this will go away in April. <sighs> wow. Look, I hope this works out. I hope to God. I pray to Jesus. I will pray to Jesus that this will not grow into a massive worldwide outbreak. And I know you're thinking like, Al, you're pretty well known as a Jew. And how does that give us any comfort at all that you're praying to Jesus? I'm sorry, I'm just grasping at fucking straws, okay? But I can't take Donald Trump seriously, and you will understand why when you hear this interview with David Farenthold. So we'll be right back with David uh, after this word from our sponsor, Cigarette aficionado. Now, just a word about uh, Cigarette aficionado. This is a commercial uh, parody. There's no magazine Cigarette aficionado. Uh, but some of you may know that I, I was, uh, before uh, I was a senator, I was in comedy. It's unusual. It's unusual in the U.S. Senate. Uh, I think there were only seven or eight previously who had been in and comedy. 
So uh, I just decided to play a commercial parody. That's what we used to call them on Saturday Night Live. I think they still do. Uh, for a magazine that doesn't exist. And now I had a number of listeners who were extremely upset uh, by this ad for Cigarette Aficionado. Uh, they heard the ad and thought it was, I was actually being sponsored by a magazine uh, that celebrates tobacco, that the tobacco companies were uh, behind uh, this uh, show and podcast. Uh, but that is not the case at all. I was actually trying to make fun of tobacco and the tropes from Cigar Aficionado, which glamorized smoking, and I guess that was lost on a, a few folks. So now I'm going to play our parody commercial for Cigarette Aficionado, a magazine that does not exist and right after, I will tell you why I thought that there were enough clues that this was not a real ad for a real magazine. So here goes. If you are a discerning smoker like I am, you know that there's a big difference between a cigarette that just delivers the nicotine you crave and one that provides a rich, smooth, satisfying smoke. Gracing the cover of this month's Cigarette Aficionado is international movie star Javier Bardem, smoking a Dunhill Fine Cut Black. This special blend has been cut 46 times per inch to produce the quality smoking pleasure that Dunhill is famous for. With 7 milligrams of tar and 0.8 milligrams of nicotine, a Dunhill Fine Cut Black is the perfect midday break when you're looking for a cigarette that can deliver that much needed kick. Dunhill, of course, was just featured in Cigarette Aficionado's special annual edition, coming in a well-deserved fourth in this year's list of the world's top 100 cigarettes. Also this month, a photo feature of heavy smoker Ralph Nader. See Ralph wearing Versace, showing off his things, as he likes to call them, starting with his $80 million Hamptons mansion and his collection of classic, dangerous cars. But which of Ralph's things does he value the most? Why, it's his vintage cigarette lighters. Also this month, enjoy a special section featuring smoked foods. Yum. It's a great issue of a great magazine for a free three-month subscription. Go to cigaretteaficionado.com backslash Al. Okay. Uh, now, again, that that uh, I got a lot of flack for that because a lot of people, uh, not a lot, a number of people, I don't know how many really, but a number wrote in, uh, thinking that I, that I was now being sponsored by uh, the tobacco industry in some way. And here's why I thought that uh, this is what I was thinking, anyway, uh, about the elements in the ads and why I thought it signaled this isn't a real magazine and why I picked, made the choices I made. Uh, Javier uh, Bardem. I thought he was about the right choice for the guy smoking a cigarette on the cover of a magazine called Cigarette Aficionado because Cigar Aficionado like celebrates smoking tobacco in the form of, of cigars, and they have movie stars. Javier Bardem, is, he's sexy, he's very masculine, and it sends a message about cigars that you're sexy and very successful, for God's sakes, and well-dressed if you smoke a cigar. So uh, I thought, okay, okay, don't know it's a parody yet. You know, of course Cigarette Aficionado would have Javier Bardem. I thought the reference to the 100 top cigarette <laughs> issue was a tip, was a good tip that this was a parody. Uh, I thought the idea of the top 100 cigarettes uh, in the world, I thought it was funny. I thought it was funny. Uh, and let me tell you why. Are there 
at a certain point, do you distinguish between cigarettes, the quality of cigarettes? Now, maybe I've never smoked cigarettes. But I think once you get down, I don't know, I picked Dunhill for the cover for a reason. It was the only one I could think of that claims to be higher quality in the way cigar aficionado claims that certain cigars are superior. Anyway, I don't want to over-explain this, okay? So let me go move on to the feature with Ralph Nader. (laughs) Uh, Showing off his $80 million Hamptons estate. I don't think Ralph Nader has an $80 million Hampton estate. I thought most people would understand that. He it doesn't seem to be a materialistic guy, and that's kind of... And I don't think he'd dress in Versace for a magazine spread. And then the showing off his favorite things, the things that... <laughs> Ralph Possessions that Ralph Nader refers to as my things. I thought that was funny. Uh, especially, I thought that a good tip-off was his collection of classic dangerous cars. Now, uh, Ralph Nader wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed, and that was his sort of big ticket. Look, I'm old. I'm old. And thank God there are people listening to this who are not. But I guess I realize there are just some people who, who are listening who don't know who Ralph Nader is and didn't understand this. And then the feature on smoked foods. <laughs> I... Uh, I thought that was clearly absurd, uh, but I guess not. And I imagine I started imagining what that would taste like. Um, food smoked, and it doesn't mean they were smoked uh, in tobacco smoke. So it could have been hickory, could have been something else. So I could see why people thought this was a real ad, and I apologize. I do. I sincerely apologize. Anyway, I'm just thrilled that people are are tuning into the show and the podcast for serious content. That's that's I'm very happy you're doing that. And uh, as listeners know, that's my intention here. But every once in a while, I may throw you a curve. So what I'm saying is just stay awake, everybody. Stay awake, okay? And I think you will. Boy, will you stay awake for uh, David Farenthold. What a great guest. And uh, he's coming up in just a minute. It's going to be a great one, you know, for a change. Uh, David Farenthold is a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist uh, for the Washington Post. He won the Pulitzer uh, because of his really painstaking and thorough reporting on Trump's foundation, which it turns out was kind of a scam (laughs) and uh, has now been shut down by the state of New York. So uh, thank you, David, for uh, joining us. Hey, great great to be here. And uh, thank you for all the reporting you've done on uh, on Trump's finances. And um, just curiously, uh, let me ask you, what corrupt schemes of Trump's are you currently investigating? The big priority for this year is to find out how much money the federal government is paying Trump's businesses. We mm-hmm. know that it is. We know that it's a lot. Uh, you know, we found four hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars in payments already. And but I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. The and this is Mar-a-Lago. This is Scotland. This is all these the, things, right? Yeah. I mean, well, we've just looked at one government agency so far, which is the Secret Service. Right? They have to follow him wherever he goes, and then he, they're sort of captive customers for him. He gets to choose whatever he wants to charge them, and the Secret Service can pay whatever it's charged. So we are looking at what he charges them to come with him to Mar-a-Lago, to come with him to Bedminster, sometimes to rent things at Bedminster when he's not even there. Um, So, yeah, I think there's more than just the Secret Service, but that's the part that we're looking at first. So this is obviously uh, his his golf courses or resorts or whatever these are, and uh, the Secret Service has to stay there Mm -hmm. uh, for, for security reasons, and he can pretty much... What does he charge him? Does he charge him above uh, what normal people pay? Not that normal people go to any of these, either of these places. (laughs) 
Well, the, the the ones we've looked at so far are Bedminster and Mar-a-Lago, and they both have a few guest rooms. They're not really hotels, but they have a few rooms, and they don't publish the rates. They don't, you know, even if you're a member, you have to call and get the rate for tonight. So they don't they don't say what regular people pay. Um, ah, the only that's, ref- that's a great uh, that's, that's a great, great out. <laughs> right, but so but the good thing for us is that last year Eric Trump, the president's son, actually gave a really definitive answer about. Uh, what his, co- his his company was charging the government. He says, when the government officials come with my father to our properties, we charge him just, you know, he says, first he said it was free. And then he said, well, it wasn't, he's not totally free. We just charge him the cost of housekeeping. So just the cost of cleaning their rooms. By the way, everyone, uh, if you go to a hotel, uh, tip your housekeeper. Yes. Uh, you know, please. So that would <laughs> be like a $10 charge then? The figure he gave was 50 bucks. Uh, and mm-hmm. we've talked to sort of hotel industry experts about, you know, what does it cost just to clean a room? And it's like for a luxury hotel, it's like 50 to 70 bucks. So th- that's about oh, the I cost see, of housekeeping. I see. Because they pay the housekeepers, of course. And, you and, get to put and th- how many of them are uh, are legal or, well, or of the housekeepers? The, the ones at Mar-a-Lago are all um, – they're all guest workers. He imports guest workers. So they're legal, but they're not they're legal. immigrants. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. Good for him. <laughs> the, but the thing is, we haven't found a single instance, and I've I've been looking for it, any instance at all where I can see that Eric actually did what he said, you know, where the Trump org actually charged the government 50 bucks. We found rates $400, $560, $650 a night. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Are you saying that Eric may have been misleading people? <laughs> I don't want to prejudge it. Maybe there's some examples out there that I haven't found yet. I'm just saying that every single example that I've found so Is far... Is there any history of that <laughs> in your research uh, uh, of them being misleading. Now, the, the, let's go back to the first thing, which is the that you did, which is the Trump Foundation. And um, there are some pretty hilarious <laughs> uh, stories there. You, <laughs> you're probably better telling these than I am. Well, uh, just to give a couple. Um, so the Trump Foundation was this little charity that Trump had set up in the 80s. Donald Trump had set up in the 80s. Uh, and it, basically, it for the last you know five or ten years before he ran for office, it had been giving away other people's money. For some reason, other people gave him money, which he then gave away under the name of the Donald Trump Foundation. So people thought they were getting his money, but it wasn't. Uh, and the the weird thing about it, one of the weird things about it, was what he bought with this charity's money, uh, including uh, a couple different very large portraits of himself. Uh, so he would go to these charity auctions at Mar-a-Lago. People would bring a painting of him, I think, figuring, like, well, he's, you know, he's got to buy it. What a, what a blow to him if a painting of him goes unsold in his house. So he bought one painting for $10,000. He bought one painting for $20,000, which is great. That's fine. There's ch- an auction for charity. But then he used his charity's money to pay for it. So the foundation pays for his portraits. Exactly. And uh, basically... There's no justification for that at all, right? <laughs> no. One of the basic rules about charity is that even if your name is on the charity, it's not your money. It's a, the charity is a separate pot of money that's meant for the public good. And so it's you a can't, foundation. It's yeah. a foundation, right? That's why it's tax exempt, yeah. yeah. So you can't use it to buy decorations for your house. You can't use it to buy anything for yourself. Um, so we wanted to know, okay, well, now that these paintings... Well, were, wait a minute, wait a minute. Decorations. He's. I know that he's hung... The portraits have been hung at uh, some of the hotels, maybe at Mar-a-Lago and uh, somewhere else. One at Doral. Um, so there was a... We, oh, we, we yeah, well, a, that's the G7. Right. Uh, <laughs> perfect <laughs> place for the G7. Exactly. So they could see the portrait. So, yeah, they had said... They wouldn't tell us where it was, but one of our readers found it on the wall at, at Doral, decorating the sports bar there. So that's pretty much the definition of what you should not do with a charity's assets. But wasn't, wasn't Doral actually doing a service which was storing it? Right. That was, that was the, um, the argument from the Trump campaign was, well, yeah, it looks bad. It looks like the Trump charity did a favor for the Trump business by buying art for the business's walls. But you have it all wrong. Really, the business is doing the charity a favor by storing its art collection for free. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you, we're journalists. We got to check these things out. So I called oh, up. Oh, man. I called up a, a, a sort of a tax expert and said, you know, does this hold water? Is this could you? T-? And, and the guy said, you know, it's it's not easy to make an IRS auditor laugh, but this would do it. I actually had an auditor once uh, uh-huh. audit me and Tom Davis. We had a corporation. Uh huh. 
this was the weirdest thing. He was there for in my business manager's office for a week. I don't know why I'm telling this story, but <laughs> here's the thing. He sees a receipt for a dinner that I had with Lorne Michaels and Paul McCartney uh-huh. and Tom in London. Uh-huh. And he said, you had dinner with Paul McCartney? And I said, yeah. And he goes, okay, audit's over. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I was fine. <laughs> it's good. All right. Okay, uh, you know, so, okay, I'll keep going. I thought that was a good, uh, a good <laughs> audit story. So that was one of the many things. So the, in the end, <laughs> the the Trump, the uh, New York Attorney General sued the Trump Foundation um, for that and a variety of other things. He used this charity to help his political campaign. He used it to pay off legal debts for his businesses. Um, and they sued the Trump Foundation saying that none of that stuff is what you're supposed to do with the charity's money. And so in the end, the Trump Foundation gets dissolved and Trump had to pay a $2 million fine personally. Give for- an example of the legal debt <laughs> that the foundation paid because he legally owed some money. And what was that about? So, though, in one case, there's a charity golf tournament at one of Trump's golf courses in New York. And they have this prize. Hit a hole, hit a hole in one, win a million dollars. Okay, they're out there, and with some hole, a guy, one of the contestants, a guy from New York, hits a hole in one. Wow, it's a big deal. They take his picture. You know, they they he's back in the clubhouse buying drinks. It says, you know, he's gonna he won a million dollars. And then they sort of tap him on the shoulder and say, actually, if you read the fine print of the win a million dollars sweepstakes, it says that the ball has to travel a certain number of yards before it goes in the hole for it to be eligible. And Trump's course just happened to have set it up so that the tee and the hole were not far enough apart that that, you know, to exceed that limit. So, yes, even though you hit the hole in one, you don't win the hole in one prize because, the, you know, you didn't hit it far enough. It was yeah, a, it was just uh, the pin was just far enough, uh, close enough. That you couldn't that- win. That you couldn't win. So, uh, so the guy then sued. he sued, and mm-hmm. uh, they settled or something, mm-hmm. and the Trump Foundation paid for that. Exactly. Right? So he he sued the Trump Golf Course because obviously the Trump Golf Course right. was the one at fault, and the Trump Golf Course settled with the guy. But then the Trump Foundation, again, a legal legally separate tax exempt charity with nothing to do with this golf hole in one thing. They, the Trump Foundation paid the bill. <laughs> okay, so this is just sleaze, sleaze, sleaze. There's a couple stories there that I really like. One, one you got into this because uh, he, he did this thing when uh, he was feuding with Fox. And instead of doing the Fox debate, he did this uh, event of his own and said he was giving like a million dollars or several million dollars to vets, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, a million dollars out of his own pocket. That's right. A million dollars out of his own pocket. And you just wanted to – you were curious, right? We wanted to – I mean, this is a claim that matters because both it shows you that Trump really cares about veterans and it shows you he's really rich. Like, those are two key parts of his appeal in 2016. So we want to just check and make sure that he did the thing that he said he did. And I thought this is like a simple story. We'll call it and they'll say, yeah, of course. He gave this money to this charity. You can call him and check. But, of course, it was not like that. It, instead, what we got was a call from Corey Lewandowski, who was Trump's um, campaign manager then. Great guy. Great, yeah. <laughs> great guy. I have to thank him. I mean, he sort of set me off on, on this path um, by telling me something. Because he the, lied to you by yeah, lying exactly. to you. It was a, wonder, <laughs> a wonderfully life-changing lie. Um, and yeah. so he said, well, I can tell you for sure that Donald Trump has given away that million dollars to veterans, but I can't tell you who he got, gave it to or when or in what amount. It's all a secret. Just trust us. He's given away his million dollars. Now, you're an investigative reporter. Does that strike you as uh, <laughs> suspicious, it's, that, it's that not, answer? not the kind of thing that you just say, okay, thanks a lot, and, and, and leave it at that, right? You've got to check this out. So we, start, we started to think, well, how in the world are we going to prove this, right? If the Trump people won't give us any information. You know, we, we're in a position of trying to prove Donald Trump right. Let's find the money that he gave away. So then I did all this work on Twitter trying to find anybody, you know, say anybody out there got even a dollar of this money. Tell me about it and we'll prove Trump was right. Um, and it went on and on and on. Nobody, nobody had any of the money. And the reason that, that they couldn't find the money was because Trump had not given it away. It was still in his pocket. When Lewandowski told me, oh, he gave the million dollars away, totally wrong. Trump later actually it, it made, was not true. It was not true in any way. Shocking. Yeah. Shocking. I'm going to write that down <laughs> as a lie that came from uh, the Trump people. So like we Corey Landau. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> don't forget it. Sure, shooting. Corey. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I got it. I, I have a short hand here. So 
Trump then called me after we made a big stink out of it, and he called me and said, okay, now I've given the money away. This is days, <laughs> days after what Lewandowski uh, had said. When it said, Lewandowski had said it was already gone. And I said, you know, basically, why? You know, you said you were going to give this money away months ago. Corey said you'd already given it away a few days ago. Why are you just giving it away now? Basically, were you going to sit on this money and not give it away unless we made a big stink out of it? Um, and it, it basically called me a nasty person and didn't answer the question. Wow. <laughs> Again, you must have felt terrible. It, it was a really interesting experience as a reporter because obviously I've had tense conversations with people in the past where people want to insult me or tell me I did something wrong. But this was not like that because he doesn't know anything about me. And he's just, like, I guess he wants to have a fight about whether I'm a nasty person or not. But like, he doesn't know me. So it's not like there's anything there to that argument. You know, I don't know whether you're nasty or not. I mean, I don't. And, and, and the way you've comported yourself. Uh, through all this, it, it doesn't seem that you're nasty. <laughs> Thank you. But, um, you know, I have no way of knowing. That didn't seem like a nasty thing for you to be pursuing, though. No. I will say that. I, I, it was a weird conversation with for me because he would be like, oh, you're so nasty. You're such a terrible person. Like, he wanted to get an argument about this silly thing. And then I was mm -hmm. like, okay, let's go back to the actual facts. You know, I have some other – he was sitting on some other people's money that they'd given him that he was supposed to be giving away. You know, what happened with that? And he would sort of address that question as I'd asked it, and then but then his answer would quickly devolve into, like, you're so nasty, you should be ashamed of yourself, blah, blah, blah. And we did that sort of reset <laughs> thing like four times before we just sort of gave up. Uh-huh. Wow. Okay, one of my favorite stories from that, that stuff was the one where he goes on stage – at a fundraiser for kids with AIDS, right? Mm -hmm. And he has nothing to do with it, is no part of this organization, just gets on the stage mm -hmm. to make it look like he's part of this, right? Mm -hmm. It's an orphanage <laughs> for, for kids with AIDS. Um, an orphanage. Uh, right. That's being open. It's like, I think this is like 1995, and it's a big deal in New York. Like, Giuliani, who was the mayor, was there. David Dinkins, the ex mayor, was there. Frank and Kathy Lee Gifford had given a lot of the money to make this possible, so they're there. So there's, there, there's all this lined up people on the stage, donors and dignitaries, and there's all these cameras in the audience. So, you know, it's going to be a big deal in New York. And so there's one empty chair on stage that was saved for this real estate guy who actually had given some money, and he's late getting there or something. Trump, who's never given these people a dime, they've never had any contact with him, walks in, gets up on stage, and sits in that guy's seat. And then everyone's like, well, what do we do? You know, Trump's sitting in the seat. <laughs> but they're, and they're thinking, well, you know, we don't want to make a scene. And also, like, maybe he's going to surprise us with a big million-dollar donation. So just don't say anything. So they have the ceremony. They, they sing. Uh, they do the Macarena with the orphans. Um, their speech is given, and at the end, they're all waiting for, like, okay, Trump's going to hit us with this big check, and then he just walks out and leaves. Uh, like, he did all that and took the place, you know, took the all the prestige of being a donor and then just vanished and didn't give a dollar. What I, what I really like about this, orphans with AIDS. <laughs> yes. An orphanage for orphans with AIDS. You can't get more ironic... I mean, you can't get a better thing for him to have done this at. It's a, it I was, mean, yeah. n there's nothing worse. <laughs> right. It's about the neediest <laughs> population you can imagine. Wow. Okay. Um, so you're investigating now all this um, stuff that he's charging people and how he's using his, uh, his office to make money, right? Yes. Okay, we have the charging the Secret Service, charging the military in Scotland, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a, a broader aspect of, you know, using his office to increase his wealth? I mean, there's obviously the Trump International Hotel in which uh, a lot of uh, people who want to curry the favor of the Trump administration come and, and stay. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, this be international people or just, you know, American uh, lobbyists or businessmen who are coming from out of town and and want to let him know mm -hmm. that I stayed at your hotel. And, and 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 by the way, it's a beautiful, beautiful hotel, the uh, Trump International. Um, I actually go there uh, for breakfast at the International House of Pancakes, <laughs> which is so uh, fancy there. He's renamed it Trump's. 
International House of Crepes. <laughs> and you can get a $100 cocktail. You, you wrote about this, basically the Star Wars bar <laughs> at, uh, at, at the Trump International with people like Giuliani and Lev and Igor. And you can just go there and get access to them if you buy a cocktail. That's right. Giuliani actually puts out a sign on his table at the bar that says Rudolph W. Giuliani private office. So, yeah, you can just for the price of a cocktail, you can go up and talk business with the president's personal lawyer. I mean, it's, he's sort of advertising his presence there. I read, I think, in an article uh, you wrote that uh, they now have a hundred dollar cocktail, a cocktail that costs a hundred bucks and it has caviar in it. I mean, I carry my own caviar for that reason, just to sprinkle it in whatever. But if you get to pay for it, it's a huge markup. Uh, th- that's right. They basically, at the start of the hotel, before he won, had sort of – there was expensive drinks. But, but okay, eventually- hang on, <laughs> hang on. I don't drink cocktails. I'm not a I'm, – I I'm just don't do that. I, I sometimes have wine with spaghetti, and I sometimes <laughs> – have a beer with a hot dog. So I'm not a big uh, drinker, uh, and I don't know the cocktail world. I know everyone loves, loves, loves cocktails. Caviar in a cocktail. And an oyster. There's also an oyster in that cocktail. I mean, it sounds t- revolting, actually. It sounds like something you just order to say you order the $100 I like cocktail. oysters, yeah, and right. I've had caviar. But in a liquid, I... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. They also I don't know. Have, maybe it's delicious. It's not actually the most expensive drink there. The most expensive drink is you can get wine, a little bit of wine served in a crystal spoon for like 250 bucks a spoon. I hope it's a big spoon. <laughs> no, is it like a, a ladle no. or what is it? <laughs> it's like a shovel. No, it's a it's a regular it's a very small it's like a tablespoon. And I guess the wine is so good. I've never had it. I guess it's so good that you 250 bucks is a bargain. Okay, that... <laughs> At least they should ring a bell or something so people know you're doing it. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> so people know you're okay. spending big. So uh, that, that's another thing is that he's making money on that hotel by whoever is lobbying uh, can, can, can stay there and say they stayed there and pay uh, through the nose uh, for that honor. I mean, the, the great example of that is T-Mobile. T-Mobile announces a merger that needs Trump organization, I mean, sorry, Trump administration approval. The next day, nine of their executives show up at the Trump Hotel en masse. They wear T-Mobile clothes. They sort of gallivant around the lobby taking selfies. And they come back again and again. They spent like $200,000 in a few months on hotel rooms at the Trump Hotel at, right after they needed his help. Okay, so one of the things I want to discuss with you, the, during the campaign... The Clinton Foundation was under attack, and by the New York Times, and uh, a little by the Post, but more the New York Times. And ironically, this foundation, the Clinton Foundation, which has saved millions of lives by providing HIV drugs to impoverished countries, was suddenly it that was the target and the Trump Foundation wasn't. I was I mean it was interesting to be in in the middle of all that. I mean obviously the Clinton Foundation was such a different animal than the Trump Foundation. It had lots and lots of employees, lots and lots of money. It did a lot of things around the world and the questions about <laughs> it were like, you know, were they you know, were they taking money from the wrong people? But you couldn't argue that it wasn't a real thing. It didn't actually do charitable work. Uh, and then the Trump Foundation was basically just like a bank account that was being used for, just, you know, giving some legitimate charitable donations, but also doing a lot of things that turned out to be illegal. Um, and it was interesting to see the way that people focus on one or the other. The, one of the reasons I did made my reporting so public was that I was hoping to get more people covering it. You know, I wanted more people on the story just because I felt like we'd learn more if there was more people covering it. Uh, but for whatever reason, there was a lot less coverage of that than the, you know, overall than the Clinton Foundation. You know, this is a, a, a president who uh, every day something outrageous or three times a day or <laughs> every once in a while probably skips a day. But there's something uh awful that he does and then it's such so much tonnage that you forget it right 
that you can't possibly it's just it's just you can't remember anything that happened last week <laughs> so i can you give us a sort of a quick litany of the stories you've investigated involving trump acting in a crooked unsavory way and you're right about that. It's, it's hard for me, even somebody who's in the news business, to keep track of what happened last week. I mean, the things that we've written about a lot over the last couple of years covering his business are, one, that his businesses are generally not doing very well. A lot of his big hotels and resorts like Doral are doing pretty poorly. Number two, he turns out to have employed a huge number of undocumented immigrants, even as he was telling everybody else that undocumented immigrants were the source of all of America's problems. Uh, and number three, he apparently he had this hidden but pretty lucrative business relationship with his own government that neither he nor the government was telling anybody about, uh, even while that was happening. In fact, what they were telling people about this relationship was that he wasn't profiting off it. It was just a few dollars. It was just you know doing things at cost, none of which appears to be true as far as we can tell. Those are and, of, and is that beyond the hotel and and the Mar-a-Lago and so the place the main places we've seen it now are as you as you said overseas at Turnberry Mar-a-Lago Bedminster and the Trump Hotel in D.C. But the Trump Hotel in D.C. is really interesting. The Secret Service has spent like a hundred and fifty thousand dollars there at least on I, I don't know what they won't tell us what they're buying. But that makes no sense. The Secret Service doesn't need rooms at the Trump Hotel in D.C. All the Secret Service agents live in Washington, D.C. Their headquarters is down the street. Trump never stays there. Why are they spending one hundred and fifty thousand dollars just in Trump's first year at his hotel in D.C.? That's I feel like we know nothing about that. But there's got to be some amazing stories behind what they're being charged to stay in their own town, in their own headquarters town. Well, have you written about that? We've mentioned it a little bit. I'm trying to find out more. You know, just because the you know, I, I, oh, get, you and not writing about it until you have all the facts. <laughs> we got we got uh, a little while longer, and I got so why you want another Pulitzer? <laughs> I got I got faith. is that it? Is that how you get those Pulitzers? <laughs> By looking up all the facts yeah. and not going with it until you have yeah. the facts. Yeah. Well, I wish the New York Times had done that before they remember there was this. A book by Peter Schweitzer, who's like a Breitbart guy, mm-hmm. and the New York Times made a deal with him and printed all these bogus charges. Uh, you know, yeah, they had accusations. They a lot about the Clinton cash. That was the book from the beginning. I think he published it in 2015. The Clinton cash. Yeah, dude. Yeah, there was a lot of that. They 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 quoted him quite a bit. I mean, we did too. Yep, and that started early. You got it's well before you uh, you did your reporting, and so. The narrative in that election was that the Clinton Foundation is uh, hinky, and uh, God bless uh, Donald Trump for having a, a foundation. We, I, I mean, I think everybody has has sort of discussed this to death. But we, you know, as the media, we're not ready for Trump. Like I think we just didn't expect that. We had never dealt with a candidate who didn't show shame when we revealed that he had done something that appeared bad or he'd even try to explain it right he just moved on to some other new controversy so we were trying to cover yesterday's controversy and today he's insulting rosie o'donnell or insulting the judge in indiana or whatever we i think we even now we're struggling to adapt but especially then we just didn't have the understanding of what it was like to cover somebody like him and clinton was for better or worse a lot more like the candidates we had covered in the past and she reacted in a way that was similar to the way we we cover things in the past, which is if you revealed something that she looked bad or that she was embarrassed of, she would talk about it, try to explain it, and keep the story going. Right, and it was like there were two stories. I mean, there were her emails, which was sort of the story. If you did a word cloud or mm-hmm. what's that called? Yeah. Emails would have been it. That would have been her word cloud and at the end of the election, and that was, of course, from uh, the Russians and the... Somewhat coordinated effort, and well, we we discussed that here. Um, so now you're you're doing uh, kind of the corruption where they're getting money from all these places he owns and charging government people to stay there. Right. I mean, this is this is our money as taxpayers being spent to the president, and you know, being paid to the president's companies, and so like, we have an interest in both in, in both ends, right? It's our money, and uh, the president's the guy we chose. And so, you know, we have a huge interest in understanding that business relationship, but there's almost nothing about it that's been revealed uh, publicly. And even in the places where it's supposed to be detailed publicly, it's not. Just to give you an example, 
Biden, when Biden was vice president, he rented a cottage at his place in Delaware to the Secret Service. And people criticized him for it at the time, but at least he told people about it. He posted it in these public <laughs> spending databases. He said this is what he was getting. None of the spending that Trump is that Trump is getting is appearing in the same databases. And instead, it comes out sort of a little bit at a time in some Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, where there's no sort of systematic accounting for it, even, you know, delayed. There's none. So that's what we're trying to give people is a sense of, like, you can't judge Donald Trump on this unless you know what he's done. And so we're trying to sort of build that out over this year. Okay, can we just revisit for a second the undocumenteds who uh, worked at his golf courses and, and, and resorts? Have these people, uh, would you say it's fair that they've kind of been exploited? Well, I mean... They thought they understood the bargain, right? They got, like a lot of other undocumented workers, their pay wasn't great. They often didn't get benefits. They had to work long hours. But, you know, they got paid. They want, What they wanted was, you know, that was sort of all they were aiming for in life was to get to have a steady job that paid them. And they understood they weren't going to get paid as well as legal workers. But then, you know, they start to see this guy that they work for, and they think, well, he, he knows the bargain, too. He knows, our, he knows who we are. He knows why he's paying us so little. They start to see that guy go on TV and say, Undocumented immigrants are terrible. I would never, I would never employ them. They're ruining our country, and that's what got a couple of them to say, "Okay, well, it's it's worth outing myself to show people that this guy is a hypocrite." Um, and then once a couple of them spoke out, then Trump started firing the Trump organization started firing all its others, other undocumented workers, and you just got to see all of a sudden, wow, this the, this was much more widespread than we thought. Here's a guy who really ran on how awful. <laughs> it is that there are these undocumented taking jobs away from Americans. It's the first thing he said after he came down the escalator. Yeah. Some of these people had worked for him for 10 or 15 years when they got fired. So he started firing them right away? Uh, starting after the first two came forward, he started firing them, but not all at once. Some of them got fired in the wintertime. Um, basically, the the firings often happen when they were sort of most convenient for the Trump organization. So you fire golf course workers in the wintertime when no one's playing golf. They had work, undocumented workers at the Trump winery in Virginia. They waited until the entire harvest was over and then fired them. So that was like a year after it was first revealed. <laughs> oh, man. All right. <laughs> do, you, do you get the, sometimes the idea that people are going like, yeah, yeah, we know he's a crook. Yeah, I'm, yeah, we know he's a hypocrite. Yeah, uh, but he's—I uh, um, don't know. I don't know what they're thinking, but they think something, right? Yeah, what I are mean, they thinking? there are people out there who say, "Well, you know, it doesn't matter to me. I hope he makes a lot of money." You know, but basically, I think he's doing a great thing for the country, so I don't care if he profits personally. It's just like that's fine. I mean, as long as you, what I want you to do is to know about it. If you know about it and you think you make a moral calculation that you're okay with it, or you think you should do it, fine. The key thing here is you can't make that decision unless you actually know the true scope of what he's doing. So I don't really care what people, how people react to it. It's just as long as they know it. So so you're neutral in all this because you have to be because you're a journalist. Yeah. I mean, I want people – this is a, this thing about what are taxpayers paying him. I feel like that's the thing that readers ask me the most. Okay, what, you know, what are taxpayers paying him you know, through his businesses? And I had always thought, well – it's not worth spending that much time on because I don't think it's that much money. I mean, Eric Trump said it was just the cost of housekeeping. It was just 50 bucks a room. And then we got uh, uh, this watchdog group got a public records request back late last year that showed huge amounts of Secret Service spending just in the first six months of Trump's term, like $250,000 in the first six months. And we went, whoa, okay, so what they told us was wrong. There's a lot more out here, and people are concerned about this real thing. There's, real, there's really more there. That's why we're sort of on that this year. Okay, well, uh, Godspeed. Good luck on that. Uh, keep up the great work. Thank you. And uh, we'll be reading you. It's uh, called the Washington Post. <laughs> and it's a newspaper uh, in the nation's capital. And their, their slogan is, Democracy Dies in Darkness. And our slogan here uh, is, Democracy Dies in Silence. And the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and tenement halls. I wonder if I can get Paul to give us give us the thing. I have probably some publishing or somebody else. And goodbye. 
Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing. We'll talk again next week. <laughs>